back by popular demand is the incomparable Mike Montero. In 2015, he taught us how to present with confidence. In 2017, he taught us how to fight fascism. Now, in the wake of his most significant book, Ruined by Design, Mike is back at From Business to Buttons for the third time. And he's still upset. Pay close attention to the lamentations of Mike Montero. Pleasant, unemotional conversation helps digestion. Father serves mother first, then daughter. The boys. Don't worry, fellas, you won't get left. On Tuesday, June 16th, 2015, Donald Trump descended a golden escalator to the lobby of Trump Tower and announced that Mexicans were rapists. America laughed because the whole thing was ridiculous. Well, some of America laughed. Some of America didn't. Some of America decided this was excellent. Some of America decided this was just the kind of message they needed to hear. Trump was the immigrant took our jobs meme made pustulant flesh. Some of America, mostly white, mostly male, decided this was exactly what America needed. Because to grow up white and male within a system that's designed specifically for you to succeed, and yet not succeed? Well, that's embarrassing. And Trump was giving those white males an easy out. They could blame immigrants, which, let's be honest, a lot of those white males were already doing. But Trump was saying the quiet part out loud. And on November 8th, 2016, some Americans, mostly white, mostly male, took that out that Donald Trump was handing them. And they made him president of the United States. I'm an immigrant. My parents, along with my brother and I, we arrived in the United States on January 20th, 1970. I was two years old. I wasn't born here, but this is the only home I've ever known. So after Trump was elected, I joined the immigrant resistance, mostly, mostly behind the safety of a large, shiny computer screen. And I raised my voice along with the rest of my immigrant brothers and sisters in renouncing his xenophobic, racist bullshit. The first talk I wrote during the Trump administration was titled How to Fight Fascism. And it ended with a slide that said, made by an immigrant. A slide which I've copied over into every talk I've given since then. And I was very proud to stand defiantly in front of that slide at the end of my talks. I convinced myself that I was standing in solidarity, solidarity with other immigrants in the crowd. And I was. But there was a word missing because yeah, I, I am an immigrant, but my lineage is a little more complex than that. I'm a Portuguese immigrant.
My people were in shipping. And as Letty in Lovecraft Country so succinctly put it, I mean slavery. If you're an African American, there's a very good chance that my ancestors and your ancestors crossed paths. And that your ancestors were free before meeting mine, but not after. My ancestors invented the Atlantic slave trade. The Portuguese rounded up free people, imprisoned them in forts, and packed them in ships. Portuguese vessels carried an estimated 5.8 million Africans into slavery, mostly to Brazil, but also to the United States. The first Portuguese came to America in the stolen bellies of stolen African women. And while historians, mostly Portuguese, will tell you that Portugal was a minor player by the time the Atlantic slave trade reached its zenith, it's kind of like saying that a fire isn't your fault because the match you used to light it has gone out. These are my people. They were in shipping. They were slavers. And if we're going to make a case for intergenerational trauma, I believe it's not only fair, but necessary to also make a case for intergenerational sin. We do not get a medal for solving a problem. We had such a large hand in causing. I am telling you these things because it makes me uncomfortable to tell you these things. In her excellent book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent, Isabel Wilkerson makes a compelling argument that America is a caste system defined by color and that color is an American invention. Before America, we were Fulani, we were Belgian, we were Irish, we were Kanuri, we were Congo, we were Polish. And yeah, we were Portuguese. But America, America made us black and white. America chained black people to the bottom and it expanded and contracted the definition of white as needed to make sure that black people stayed on the bottom. One of the surprises of the 2020 presidential election was that Trump's percentage of immigrant votes actually grew. And by surprised, I mean that my non-immigrant friends were surprised. I, I wasn't surprised. Let's talk about immigrant racism. To so look at me, I'm white. And I've certainly benefited from my skin color throughout my life. But that whiteness was a suit that I had to learn to wear. Because when my family moved to Philadelphia in 1970, they were moving into one of the most racist cities in America at the time, presided over by racist fuckstain mayor Frank Rizzo. And we moved into a small Portuguese community in a majority black neighborhood. And we moved into homes and businesses recently vacated by white flight. We came in as Portuguese. And we needed America to make us white because that is how America defines success. And we were here for success. And Frank Rizzo, well, he was happy enough to call us white when he needed our votes. So we hung the Rizzo re-election signs in our storefronts. 
And later we would hang the Reagan signs. And then eventually we would hang the Trump signs. And yeah, we crossed the street when black people came our way and we hired our own and we adopted all the slurs and we brought some of our own with us. Our goal was to achieve whiteness, which by America's definition meant hating blackness and hating other immigrants. Every immigrant group that comes into America wants to be the last immigrant group through the door. Trust me, immigrants would rip the plaque off the Statue of Liberty faster than a proud boy at a Tiki Torch Black Friday sale. And every immigrant group knows that the secret to achieving whiteness is to patiently wait in the wings until the current whites believe black people are catching up, at which point the books are open and the Irish are let in or the Ukrainians are let in or the Czechs are let in or the Portuguese are let in. In America, whiteness is a reward for stepping on black people's necks. So no, seeing that Trump had gotten more immigrant votes in 2020 than in 2016 didn't surprise me. After all, when I attempted to talk to my own family about his xenophobia, my mother's reply was, oh, he doesn't mean immigrants like us. There's always an immigrant group on deck for achieving whiteness. They're voting for their turn at bat. And my family did indeed vote for them. But when you say that immigrants don't vote in their own self-interest, that's not true. We are voting in our own self-interest. We understand how this country was designed to work. We're playing by the rules that you set. We did indeed learn it from you, Dad. I am telling you these things because it makes us both uncomfortable when I tell you these things. Let's talk about shame. I was recently having a conversation with a friend about how people we both know, people who we believe to be good people, and they are, how those people continue to work at places like Facebook and places like Twitter. Despite the overwhelming evidence that places like Facebook and Twitter are, you know, not good places. We discuss the obvious suspects, good salaries, overwhelming student loan debt, fancy job perks, and all those things are true to some extent. But I believe the biggest reason that people stay in jobs like this is shame. Because once you admit your involvement in something terrible, you have to deal with your shame. And I'm not even talking about admitting your involvement to others. I'm talking about admitting it to yourself. To admit that you've spent years working on tools to dismantle democracy is a shameful thing. Especially, especially if you've continued working on them long after the point where it was obvious that what you were working on was complicit in destroying democracy. The easiest way to keep shame at bay is to not admit those things are bad, which is one of the reasons companies distract you with things like good salaries and fancy job perks and swordfish in the cafeteria on Thursdays. Those perks are shinier than the shame. If you ever find yourself in Lisboa, in Portugal, and I encourage you to go because it's a lovely multicultural city now, you may find yourself staring at one of its marvels, 
a magnificent monument to its seafaring past. Os descobrimentos. The monument points out over the Rio Tejo, like a giant arrow, and it's adorned along the sides by action-posed statues of the great navigators of Portugal. My forefathers. This monument is a bauble. It's meant to take your mind off other things. Just six kilometers to the east of that monument, and I encourage you to walk because it's nice. It's a nice walk. You'll walk into the Pilurin Velho. It's a public square, and it once served as Portugal's premier slave auction. Walk a kilometer to the northwest of that, and you'll end up at Rua do Poço dos Negros, which means Street of the Negro Pit. This is where my ancestors threw the lifeless bodies of stolen people once they'd exhausted them. Now, there's no monument in either of these places. In fact, there's no monument or museum in Portugal dedicated to its slaving past. We don't erect monuments to shame. In fact, our slaver past can best be summed up by this quote from Renato Epifanio, president of the international Lusophone movement. Anyone who knows anything about Europe has to agree that Portugal is probably the least racist country in Europe. This can and should be one of our greatest causes of pride. It can't and it shouldn't. The smallest asshole at the asshole party is still at an asshole party. But let's go back to the United States because I am telling you these things and making myself uncomfortable only to make myself feel better about how uncomfortable I'm about to make you. After all, we were slavers because there was a market for it. But the hand of the market isn't always invisible. It has fingerprints. Now, I'm white. But for the first two decades of my life, being an immigrant was my defining characteristic. The neighbors saw me as an immigrant. The other kids at school saw me as an immigrant. The officer at the unemployment office where I'd go with my dad to serve as a translator saw me as an immigrant. And coming home crying after getting my ass kicked after school, only to have my mother tell me, this is their country, not yours, made sure that immigrant was etched deeply into my foundation. Once I left the immigrant bubble to go to college, I got to put on my white suit. So on a college campus, I was now surrounded by people who I could choose to or not choose to reveal my immigrantness to. I'd achieved the dream. I'd climbed the caste system and claimed my whiteness. Suddenly, in my mind, everything that I achieved was a product of hustle, hard work, intellect, and it felt like you could get away with anything. It felt great for a while until it didn't. This was right around the time that I found out that yes, indeed, although I was an immigrant, the history of my own people was a little extra than most. It wasn't talked about at home or in the community where I grew up. And it was during a conversation with a black classmate in college, we were talking about where we'd each come from. And I mentioned I was an immigrant. He said, no shit, where from? I said, Portugal. And I saw his face change. And I saw his body language change. And I asked him, well, what's up? And he said, oh, you don't know? Well, I didn't. We didn't have Wikipedia back then. We didn't talk about this stuff. And he told, so he told me. 
And we kind of both avoided each other after that, unsure of how to handle it. I'm sure I didn't handle it well at all. That was shame. As an immigrant, you get to be excited about America's future while also kind of taking a mulligan on its past. But as a Portuguese immigrant, well, my people were in shipping. We're the foundation of America's past. There's a line in Ijeomo Oluo's amazing book, So You Want to Talk About Race, that I've used in essays and talks before, and it bears repeating here. If you are white in a racist society, you're a racist. If you're a man in a sexist society, you are sexist. By which she means that people who look like me get these privileges regardless of whether we want them or not. And I'm quoting this line again because the first time I read it, my reaction to this was that this obviously did not apply to me. How could it? I'm so woke. I put up a slide saying that I'm an immigrant at the end of my talks. I'm pulling out this quote one more time because of how deeply uncomfortable it made me when I first read it. It covered me in shame because, of course, the line applied to me. The first time I read it, I spent the next 20 pages of the book attempting to read what she'd written, but it wasn't sinking in. It wasn't sinking in because I kept going back to that line. I kept thinking about it. And I couldn't hear anything else she was saying to me because I was spending all of my energy going back to cover this shame that her words had awoken in me and deflecting that shame to keep those words from hitting home. And I'm ashamed of how long that took because once I accepted them, I could actually hear what else she had to say. I had to acknowledge my own discomfort and my own shame before I could hear that. And that's when the work begins. And I'm telling you this because now, now is the time for people that look like me to embrace that discomfort. Now is the time to be uncomfortable. In 20 years of running our own studio, we have hired exactly one black person. Now I could go on and on about the pipeline, and I could go on and on about how you can only hire who applies and yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, once all of those excuses are gone, you are left with a very concrete truth. We have hired exactly one black person in 20 years. That's an undeniable fact. And it's a fact that makes me very uncomfortable because uncomfortable is where we need to be. It's also a fact that most of the companies in our industry are no better. You have not hired enough black people either. And if seeing this is making you uncomfortable, great. Oh, but Mike, isn't this a quota system? Maybe. But this definitely is. Believing that every white dude that walks through the door is qualified by default, that is definitely a quota system. And it's the longest running quota system in world history. You said Black Lives Mattered.
On March 13th, 2020, Brianna Taylor was asleep in her bed when three Louisville violence workers busted into her house and murdered her in her own home. And they got away with it. On May 25th, George Floyd was murdered by Minneapolis violence workers. He was handcuffed, he was thrown to the ground, and a violence worker lodged his left knee on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And George Floyd used what breath he could muster to tell the surrounding violence workers that he could not breathe almost 30 times. How many times does someone need to tell you that you are killing them? How many times did the surrounding violence workers hear it and ignore it? And they got away with it too. This is America working as designed. This is the caste system that was designed not just by America, but in order to create America. White on top, black on bottom. A caste system that was systematically enforced, first by slavery, then by Jim Crow and the Klan, redlining, restrictive covenants, police departments, and every newspaper headline about the loss of property over the loss of human life. And our government itself, which attempted a coup by throwing out votes in majority black cities of Detroit, Atlanta, and Philadelphia. And when that didn't work, a racist mob, spurred on by an American president, invaded the Capitol, carrying a white supremacist flag. This is who we are. America is so addicted to its racism that most conversations, even in, and especially white liberals' conversations about healing, still revolve around pardoning Trump and finding common ground with his base, which is like treating a bullet wound by polishing a gun. On Wednesday, we were thanking black women for saving the Republic. And by Sunday, we were extending an olive branch to people who think they should be allowed to own those same black women. And in the summer of 2020, Part of America took to the streets, spearheaded by Black Lives Matter, who in the middle of a pandemic managed to organize millions of people safely. So they were masked and socially distanced in cities and towns around the country. And those people were met by violence workers as well. And in the wake of those protests, companies and organizations and corporations posted pronouncements in support of Black Lives Matter. Some promising donations, some promising to change their culture, and some promising both. Some telling you how woke they were, and some letting you know they would have voted for Obama a third time. And beware, some of them think they just did. And while we could spend forever debating how many of those pronounces were cynical, probably more than 0%, and how many were genuine, which is probably less than 100%, for our purposes, the important part is that they did it and that they did it publicly. Which in the business is what we call a receipt. Now is a great time to ask the people and the companies 
and the organizations who made those pronouncements what their next step is. It's a great time to hold them accountable. And it's a great time for people who look like me to hold other people who look like me accountable. It will make us uncomfortable. Let it. You said Black Lives Mattered. Now prove it. The future will bring white men like me with stupid hot takes like this one and even stupider solutions. We cannot seem to help ourselves. It's what we do. Like colonizers with smallpox blankets, we show up expecting metals to solve the problems that we created. And we will always look to solve those problems to our own benefit. We hope to profit from the disease and the cure. Some of the white folks helping to pull down racist statues thought they were clearing space for statues of themselves. The truth is that I hope we are done idolizing individuals because individuals will always let you down. We, people who look like me, do not get to speak for people whose ancestors we silenced. We get to listen. We get to stop hogging the space. Space wasn't ours to begin with. We stole it. Time to give it back. We need to be uncomfortable. And I'm talking in praise of discomfort, not because it's fun, but because discomfort is where we need to be. For years, for decades, for centuries, if you look like me, you got to live in a world that was very specifically designed to make you comfortable. The fact that you, individually, didn't achieve success in that world doesn't mean it didn't exist. It means you couldn't score from third on a double. Now you can turn that shame and that discomfort into rage, as I have in the past, honestly, and as so many Trump voters did, or you can own it, you can claim it, because it's yours. And in so doing, you can keep from passing it on to the next generation. You can be a better ancestor than the ones you got. You can be a better ancestor than the ones I got. Now, there will be a role for people who look like me, but it'll be a role that we're really unaccustomed to. It'll be about listening rather than speaking, giving before we start taking, and it'll be as part of a community. And if we're lucky, we'll have as much of a chance to succeed as anyone else does. And the community's welfare will be the most important barometer to success, not our own. If we're lucky, people will treat us better than we've treated them. It'll make us uncomfortable. And that's a good start. Thank you. Unfortunately, Mike was unable to join us right now, but my colleague Jessica Biermer was able to talk to him earlier this week. So, thank you, Mike, for your talk. Um, you put your finger on, on really dark things here, and, and both in our history and our present. And you always have a strong message and in your personal and very honest about it. And I think that's what our audience loves about you. 
And we've seen that you've moved away from talking about hands-on design uh, tips to talking about more politics and ethical uh, and racism. So wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your journey from hands-on designer to a voice for reason. Well, uh, first off, it's nice to see you, Jessica. Thank you. It's nice to see you too. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I don't, I'm not sure that I ever really talked about hands-on design tips. I mean, there's plenty of other people out there doing that uh, who are much better at it than I am. Um, but I mean, it's not so much a journey as 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 much as you know, just looking to see. I solve problems, right? So I mean, that's a designer's job is to solve problems, and. Um, you take a look around and you see what the biggest problem is to solve. And then you figure out like how to call attention to it, how to, you know, maybe start figuring out how to solve it, how to do a little research into it. And, you know, the biggest problem that I'm seeing, uh, not just in the design world, but in the, in the, in the world world today is, uh, man, we treat each other like shit. We need to have a point of view on the stuff that we're putting out into the world. And I mean, this this is a message that, you know, has been like throughout my work, like for I've always been taught, like you're responsible for the shit that you make and you need to have a point of view. Like, why am I making this? Who's it going to hurt? Who's it affecting? Who's benefiting from it? Um, who's profiting from it? How? Why am I not? Who's being excluded? from this work? Who is this work undermining? Who is, you know, how is this work supporting, you know, systematic injustice? How is it, you know, uh, healing? All those are questions that we need to be asking. And, you know, you know, designers aren't, a lot of designers aren't asking those questions. You know, most designers are, you know, asking like, you know, when's my next joke? You know, when's my next raise? And when is lunch? Uh, is there anything that you would suggest for us to like take with us as uh, something that we could improve today tomorrow as a designer yeah absolutely i mean take a look at take a look at everything that you're building take a look at who's building it you know look around the room when you're making stuff um say you know say like hey why is everybody working on this project like you don't have blue eyes and blonde hair and a dick um where where's everybody else because you know they're gonna have other people are gonna have viewpoints that i'm not and shouldn't we get those viewpoints involved in this project as well and you know with all the work that you're doing like who's this for who does this benefit like make that part of your research we all, you know, we all understand that, you know, we need to do research on stuff. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, you know, the, the, the capitalist part of research, like who's going to buy this and why? And then there's, you know, the social part of research, which is even more important, is, you know, like who is this going to fuck over? Who is this, you know, going to hurt? And, and am I okay with that? Because that's that's where I'm going to be putting my labor for the next, you know, four months or so on this project is is on this thing on, on you know, this facial recognition bullshit that's going to hurt people or, you know, any other myriad of projects out there that people are doing like, like, who is this going to hurt? Thank you so much, Mike, for having this Q&A with me. We appreciate it. And thank you once again for inspiring us to become more aware of design ethics and injustices and how to take action on it. All right. Thank you. Bye, Jessica. Bye. Bye.